I think you'd better use a relaxant. Why all this panic, friend? It's not so difficult to comprehend. But uh, since you find it such a tussle, come, let's have a diagram. Here's a muscle. And over here, a nerve. Down which an impulse travels. And, observe, a chemical is formed, acetylcholine, whose action is to produce a muscular contraction. This role played, it's rapidly destroyed by an enzyme, cholinesterase. And, as you see, the cycle just completed with each succeeding impulse is repeated. Now for a relaxant. There are, as you see, a host. Uh, but a tubocurarine is better known than most. This blocks the acetylcholine's tracks and the muscle stays relaxed. A small dose of neostigmine note is quite an effective antidote. It combines with cholinesterase and some of the acetylcholine stays, accumulates, overcomes the barrier and the muscle can contract again. Uh, uh, but be careful, uh, there's a danger here. Give too much neostigmine, and all the cholinesterase may disappear. The acetylcholine will thus remain. Uh, and you see, the muscle's paralyzed again. Uh, let us now proceed to another relaxant, succinylcholine. Akin to acetylcholine in action, it even produces an initial contraction. But the effect of cholinesterase on this is slow, and the paralysis lasts a few minutes or so. And now the decamethonium, similar to the last one, and in fact, it too can cause a muscle to contract. But unaffected by cholinesterase, it will stay until the bloodstream carries it away. Its effect is protracted, therefore. The paralysis may last half an hour or more. Well, and now that we've seen the simple abstract scheme, let's see how well all this makes sense when tested on the laboratory bench. At some stage in your education, you must have seen this preparation, a rat diaphragm in ringer solution, stimulated into regular contraction. Tubocurine is added. And here we trace its action. And in a short time, we're not surprised but to see the muscle fully paralyzed. The bath is emptied. The tubocurine removed. And upon refilling, muscular conditions much improve. After a second wash to make all sweet, muscular recovery is complete. Another dose of tubocurarine is given. The tracing follows its expected path. Then neostigmine is added to the bath. As we anticipate from what has gone before, the muscle is recovering once more. But if a second, larger dose of antidote we add, conditions quickly go from good to bad. Quite soon, the muscle's paralyzed again. And note carefully, excess acetylcholine is to blame. Now, succinylcholine. First, a paralysis, then the bath washed twice. Succinylcholine added once more, and the muscle's paralyzed. Give a small dose of neostigmine again. But this time, as you see, there is no change. 
me. And if we give a larger dose still, the contractions quickly reduce to nil. From this, of course, you will deduce that neostigmine is no use for succinylcholine overdose. Nor indeed, as this trace shows, for too much decamethonium. Uh, I'm sure you've not found it hard to follow all the facts so far. But, as you must already know, there's an electrical side to this story. So, just have a look at this micro slide, which, when it's greatly magnified, shows the nerve endings on a...